And then Tracy Weiss and I got to know each other a couple of years ago because of a book project that I was working on that just was published earlier this year called Cleo in the Classroom Teaching U.S. Women's History. And Tracy contributed a chapter. And then uh, we presented together last summer at the University of Minnesota at the Berkshire Conference of Women's Historians. So um, she has done a variety of really interesting projects with the American Studies Association, uh, the Organization of American Historians. And, and she has written um, in many venues, both in print publications and online um, publications. I encourage you to Google up both of them, because I'm not doing justice to um, all of their accomplishments. But there's some really interesting things that you can find on their websites uh, and the historical history cooperative right, website mm -hmm. that I think would uh, actually be very, very interesting to you in your work as teachers. So we're pleased to have you here today. Thank you very much. For um, great. I we're going to do this as a team taught adventure, so I'll be doing the first part, and then Ron and I uh, together will be doing the second part. Um, as I made my way up from the train from Penn Station today, I remembered about seven or eight years ago, I did a lot of work um, in New York with the American Social History Project at CUNY, and a lot of work with New York area teachers. And it was wonderful to feel the dynamism of New York when you come from a small town like Lancaster. Um, it's a little different pace there. Um, I know from the work that I've done with teachers how intense a workshop like this is when you come in day after day after day, all day long. So just to give us a bit of an advantage, um, if folks would be willing to share one of the most important things that you've learned that has kind of changed how you think about teaching Vietnam over the course of the past couple of days. Anybody? And your name, please. Yes, thank you. Your name, too. I know that we have time to do comprehensive introductions, but at least we'll get some sense of where you teach and what you're, what you're learning so far. What resources have been helpful? What insights from some of the different presenters? Yes. William and Mary came and discussed just the use of documentary and how students view that as a authentic source of information and they don't take it, they don't look at it objective, or they, they view it as objective instead mm -hmm. of looking at it like they do traditional Hollywood films. And the need to have kind of rigorous protocols for interrogating evidence that students don't always think about that the same way that we might. Anybody else? Surely there are more than two insights. Anything else you're going to remember a week from now when you go, when you're finished with this whole? Um, Peg, uh, I teach in Connecticut. Uh, I think using TV graphic, uh, the cartoon or comic strips or uh, other ways of displaying images and stuff to get the kids to actually make their own choices in what, how they want to present so that they can understand mm -hmm. how doc documentary filmmakers do the same thing. Mm -hmm. The importance of selecting evidence, which is the main task, one of the main tasks of the historians. What else? We'll give you another minute for the introverted people to compose their thoughts. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to have a short presentation on thinking about how to use visual evidence. What are some of the issues around that? Uh, we'll practice um, as a group with some examples. And then we'll be asking you to do exactly what Peg was talking about, to make some selections and create your own very, very short narrative of a um, particular aspect of Vietnam. So let me begin. If we think about visual literacy, one of the things that we might begin to consider is how a broadened range of evidence, and in particular the kinds of things that um, many of you mentioned already, comics, posters, photographs, um, still images as well as moving images. How these can serve to expand the historical imagination of our students. So we think about visibility and the problem of evidence. We can imagine that on several levels. One is simply the very first comment. Um, in the United States, many people, and I imagine many high school classrooms, look at the Vietnam War from the perspective of U.S. history. 
from the perspective of American citizens and not necessarily think of it as a global um, phenomenon and think about it from the perspective of the French, think about it from the perspective of the Vietnamese themselves. So there's the visibility of the historic subject and there's also the question of using visual evidences to, to make that representation. So what we're going to do today is talk about why bother with comics or photographs or visual evidence. What are some ways that we can effectively help students to learn how to do that? That's the how question. And then at the end, after we've done some very short mini visual narratives, so what? What does a visual interpretation get us that a regular print interpretation does not get us? So starting with why. Um, I imagine that many of you are familiar with the work of the Center for History and New Media at George Mason. But let me just take a poll. How many of you have used any of their resources? OK, certainly some folks. Um, what I want to do today, is, before we get into Vietnam, I mentioned France, or the French a minute ago, is talk about uh, one of their projects, which is imaging the French Revolution. Most of what we had known about the French Revolution, as you may know, came from the documentary evidence, in particular from the pamphlets. But when we begin to look at images, we begin to understand something different about that historic phenomenon. For example, as this, one of the scholars said, who was involved in this Center for History and New Media project, to bring to the web a series of images on the French Revolution. What it lets us do is to see what happened. Not just to hear about it and to try to visualize it ourselves, but actually to see what happened. Why does this matter for today's students? As we know, students today live in a visually saturated culture. Um, even though they're surrounded by images, we know that they're not necessarily adept at interrogating images. But if we look at images, sometimes we see things in the image that we somehow did not see in the documentary evidence. Or maybe it was there, but we weren't skilled enough to read between the lines to see it. So for example, if you were interested in looking for the participation of women, in the French Revolution, you could study the documentary evidence, but you could also study the visual evidence. And you might get some different insights from each of those bodies of evidence. I'd like to talk for a minute about some, excuse me, Ron, um, some images that I use in my class in US history. This example that came from the um, Without Sanctuary website of lynching. It's a very powerful website. Some of you, I imagine, have, um, have used it in your classrooms. When I talk with students about what they learn from this, I highlighted one of the images. You might be able to tell from where you're sitting that this is a photograph that includes some young children, some young girls. Many students think about lynching as something that happens under the cover of darkness at night. You know, people uh, wear robes, sheets, things to mask their identity. When they're confronted with images that show that these events took place in broad daylight, these events were not hidden. People were making no efforts to conceal themselves. And that some of these lynchings were spectacles. That in some cases, there were um, special railroad cars that were organized to transport people to the scene of lynching. So they weren't secret. They weren't hidden. Um, in other words, visual evidence lets us see something that we might not see if we were reading a documentary account of a lynching, for example. Why use images? Because images, like print sources, get us at the center of the historical enterprise, which is a focus from the student side, the things that are most concrete, um, people and organizations, the historic actors, um, places and sites, being able to visualize. You think about a college campus. If I were to ask people, what does college campus look like? We have 30 some people in this room. We'd have 30 different pictures of college campuses. Um, I think about project I did at LaGuardia, um, walking in that block-long building and feeling the hum and recognizing that there are people in that building who come from all parts of the world. That's a very different picture and a very different experience than the residential college, kind of residential kind of commuter college where I teach at in central Pennsylvania. So places and sites, it's especially important to be able to see them. Events and dates and ideas. Ideas in some respects might be the hardest things to visualize. And yet, if we were to say to you, come up with a picture of nationalism, come up with a picture of colonialism, if we would ask our students to go out 
and bring back a picture that represents an idea. It would be probably a very provocative exercise. And we might get some overlap in the images that came back into the classroom. But we'd probably get some very different perspectives as well. So we use images because it helps us to do history better. Another reason is because of the student population we work with. I've already mentioned. They live in a visually saturated culture. These are just some examples. Um, that they are constantly looking at images, creating images. And the other thing that they're doing as well um, is sound and aural. Um, not necessarily that they've completely abandoned the written culture, but their written culture takes place with their two, fing their two thumbs. So how? How can we begin to use um, images, in this case in particular, to interrogate the Vietnam War? We need protocols for the examination of visual evidence. Um, let me try another little poll on you. Um, history Matters website, gateway to US history. How many folks have heard of it? OK, again, a few folks. If you are familiar with this website, historymatters.gmu.edu, um, they have a feature called Making Sense of Documents that is very, very helpful. Oral history, films, maps, numbers, letters, diaries, advertisements, popular music, and photography. And when, if you go to that website and you click on those links, um, it gives you some ideas of how to proceed in a rigorous and systematic way, rather than a kind of haphazard um, approach. For example, since we're going to be looking at photographs today in our presentation, I wanted, did a screenshot of Jim Curtis's presentation on making sense of documentary photography. Each of these has the same setup. There's a getting started. There's questions to ask, which are at the center. And then there's additional resources to use to follow up on. So if we think about what kinds of questions, if we're looking at photographs, what kinds of questions should we ask? We know what questions to ask when we're looking at a document, a written document. So the questions that we ask about a photograph or a visual document are similar. But there are some important differences. Who created the image is similar to who created the document. Why and for whom was the object or image produced? The question of audience. How? We don't always think so much about how when we think about uh, written documents. But how was the image produced? What was the technology involved? What kind of technology would be accessible to different parts of the population? What can companion images tell us? The context. And this is also important for print documents, but we don't usually think about it. How was the document? the image, the object, presented, recirculated, circulated, then recirculated, and received. One of the most common phrases among our young people, I think, is the notion of remix, which you think about in terms of music in particular. But how images keep coming back, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later in the presentation, in different formats with different frames. The same image with a different frame yields a different meaning. And that's part of our job here today, is to figure out how can we get at the question of meaning. I don't know how many of you took any art history classes in your lifetime, but I remember as a first year student being in a large lecture hall, um, introduction to art. And the method that I remembered was the instructor up there with two, at that point, slide projectors. So you know how old I am, slide projectors, right? You know, managing them one hand on each, um, each control. The point about that that I don't think I got as a young undergraduate, but I think I have some appreciation for now, is this idea of juxtaposition. Um, in other words, placing, in that case, two art um, history slides, two um, paintings, for example, side by side, because that lets us see some complexity <laughs> that we don't often see if we're only looking at one thing. And one of the examples I do in my classroom every semester um, is I have a willing student who will volunteer, stand in the front of the room, and I ask the other students to describe that student. So, you know, what she's, he or she's wearing, they have a hat, they have boots, they have jeans, they have khakis, and they're pretty willing to do this. Um, and then I get a second volunteer, make the first one stay up there. I get a second volunteer to go up. And right away, they start comparing. So-and-so's hair is long, so-and-so's hair is short. So-and-so's wearing blue jeans, so-and-so's wearing shorts. And I say to them, juxtaposition doesn't guarantee deep and sophisticated analysis, but it inclines us in that direction. If we have only one thing, we're often going to simply report on it or describe it. 
But once we have two things, we usually become much more alert to both similarity and to difference. And so that's one of the principles we want to think about in using visual evidence is to go back, what can companion images tell us? Some of you I know are familiar with the migrant mother photograph and the fact that if you go back to the archive and you see not just the migrant mother that's plastered everywhere in our culture, but the migrant mother as a series of photographs, it can begin to change your mind about the conditions of that photograph and the meaning of that photograph. So we're going to ask you to do later on in the presentation, as I said, I warned you, we're going to ask you to make a little <coughs> visual narrative of your own, working with some other folks. Um, if we think about a slide, the term that I use with my students when I have them produce visual narratives is this notion of a complex slide, which is simply the idea of the two students standing up in the front of the room, comparing and contrasting. That what I want them to do on the slide is to put two pieces of evidence. I have a rule in my classroom, when the bullets are flying, no one is safe. So I don't usually let students do bulleted presentations. But then they have to put on the slide two pieces of evidence. It could be two images. It could be two quotes. It could be an image and a quote. And it's up to them to select the evidence. But then the point becomes, when you have these two uh, pieces of evidence that could point in different directions, then your job as a historian is to reconcile them. You leave the workshop tonight, you go home. Somebody says, oh, how was your workshop today? You have some little tidbit from the day. We're all in the same room. We're experiencing more or less the same workshop, and yet our accounts, what we're going to select, get back to what Peg said, what we're going to select from the day is going to be different. And so we can send students to the archive, they can get different evidence, but then their job and your job today will be to interpret that evidence. Another resource which may be more familiar than either the Center for History and New Media or History Matters is the National Archives. How many folks have gone to the National Archives site? They have great resources for students and teachers. Among them are their analysis worksheets. They have one for uh, document, for artifact, cartoon, map, motion picture, photograph, poster, and sound recording. So they're wonderful. Resources are already out there for you. They're in a format that if you want to modify it for your class, you can, but you can use them straight off the web. And we'll be uh, using those today as well. Okay, the three focuses, three foci, I guess you could say. Um, observation, inference, and question. Many times our students want to jump right away to number two. We say, whoa, 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 wait, slow down. Look before you infer or question or conclude. So getting back to the issue of how we interpret visual evidence, I'm going to turn uh, the podium over to uh, Ron, and we're going to talk about um, some examples of that. Yeah, I'll pass those out. All right. Um, first of all, this is interactive. So anytime you have a question or you have a statement to see, feel free to uh, do that. Um, as Tracy is handing out some of these uh, workshops or worksheets, I'll have a question for you. Uh, and, and the question I ask you, first of all, the thing is, again, all these very visual words we've already discussed, you know, visual and visual and visual and cameras, and, and those we're taking from the images come from a variety of different sources. Um, and so, to do is uh, a beginning phase of this is to ask you when you think of the Vietnam War what is the image that pops into your mind or what type of image pops into your mind just to get a sense of it. yeah yes sir I think it's like jungle warfare. okay so jungle warfare the, the deep triple canopy jungles and the soldiers sort of trotting through that I think of those uh, very disturbing and violent Right, Gen yeah, General Loan. So the, the image of um, this, the uh, June 63, uh, the Buddhist monk uh, protesting no Dinh Diem, or uh, General Loan's uh, uh, assassination, or not, well, execution of the, the VC suspect, which is a very controversial image as well uh, in terms of that. Just think of the, the protest at home in uh, New York Times picture from Kent State with the 14 year old girl over uh, the man who had just been shot. Okay, so the turmoil that, that occurred within the United States as a result of America's involvement in Vietnam and, and sort of that, the fabric of American society unraveling in front of many people's eyes and questioning why these things are happening. There's a picture of a child running down the street just being burned, I think. So the other famous picture of the, the young girl who has been hit by napalm um, and is, is burned running down the, the, uh, the dirt road 
and the question of this is sort of becomes a symbol of the anti-war movement, just as the picture of the assassination, or I keep calling it the assassination, the execution um, of, uh, of the VC suspect. These are really images that galvanize the anti-war movement. Absolutely, as the as the war progresses, and it, it's interesting. That's an interesting uh, observation. Um, a lot of the GIs who wore the peace signs didn't necessarily wear them because they were opposed to the war or opposed to their involvement in the war, uh, but that was just a sign of the times as well. So they they had different reasons for doing that. But yeah, there's a there's a wonderful documentary. Um, um, speaking of documentaries on uh, Quezon and. There's some questions that are asked about, uh, you know, why are you wearing the peace sign and you're sitting here in a Marine in case on? And he's like, well, I'm doing it because everyone else is doing it. Um, and, oh, absolutely. And some were very, very much, very much, a, absolutely. And it's a very, very powerful symbol as well. So, but that spreads the, uh, the uh, you know, the reasons behind that. Yeah, Joe. How does it Absolutely. And I think you know, just in this very brief exercise, oh yeah, go ahead, sorry. I was going to just, uh, in the documentary they show the General Bong execution, the actual execution that yielded that iconic image. And the juxtaposition of those two is really profound, because I, having seen that image so many times, but then to see him in a casual way that he points the gun, fires, and continues walking um, is really disturbing. It, it was it was very disturbing for many in the United States um, who didn't understand the story behind it. Absolutely, and it's it's a longer story and a very controversial story in terms of why it was. But that image really begins to, to capture what many uh, individuals within the United States um, how they sort of experienced the war and uh, began to express their their feelings, emotions about the war. I think just in, in looking at this briefly. That reinforces a lot of what Tracy just said about how we, we look at images and how we interpret images and the significance of that. And what we're going to do is uh, we have three sets of, of images that we're going to, to look at and, and work on. And this, uh, this first image, um, I think we'll go through, if I might, we'll go through the, the, the worksheet and maybe we'll just do it as a group, um, look at uh, the, the different things, the, uh, the observations, the inference, and the questions and uh, kind of get a sense of, of what you make of this image. Um, but, yeah. yeah, as you say, one of the other <coughs> things that we can think about in terms of images that certainly comes across with the lynching example I gave and also our conversation about images that we think of, we think of Vietnam. As educators, we talk often about being sensitive to what our students bring into the classroom, particularly to the, their um, prior knowledge. But I think they also, uh, we know, they bring in emotions as well. Mm -hmm about all kinds of things, particularly about difficult to discuss things, um, race being one example. And so one of the things that images do, I think sometimes more powerfully than print uh, sources do, is touch into those deeply held uh, beliefs and convictions, those kind of emotions and those beliefs, not just their knowledge, because sometimes the feeling and the belief and the conviction are at odds with the knowledge. And so it's helpful, again, to think about this principle of juxtaposition. juxtaposition. We're not just juxtaposing um, a photograph and a documentary source. We're often, in the process, juxtaposing belief and knowledge and emotion. And the Vietnam War, as you probably already know and, and experienced over the last couple of days, will challenge all the beliefs and all the emotions that, uh, that you bring into it. And, and will continue to challenge those, uh, those ideas as you refine them and shape them as you teach them to your, your students. Um, so we will we'll take this image um, and we'll do this as a group. I guess I'm not going to give you any background to the image, but I'll tell you a little story about it maybe after we, we um, finish this part of the exercise. But as you look at this uh, image, what are the observables uh, here? Uh, what draws you? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay, so we have, um, do we want to do it by, by quadrant? Was that the idea? Or oh, does it matter? Does it just Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, just yeah, take take a, a minute or two and take a look at it. So certainly race. Um. Yeah. Um, clothes. Okay. I'm wondering why people like clothes. Okay. So certainly there's a, a difference in, in attire, and that's uh, 
uh, one, a, a good observable as well. Yes, sir. Kind of the juxtaposition of old and young. You have sort of an older gentleman in the background, but then a small boy right in front. Okay. So old and young. Absolutely. So what else do you see? Yeah, Bill. Yeah. They appear to be on a ship. All right. Some type of a vessel. Absolutely. Which raises uh, that question when we get into the emphasis of why. Well, let's see. Yeah. They look like they're in the middle of doing something or on their way to. You know, there's activity. It's not a staged photo. Yeah. There's there's motion. There's mm-hmm. activity. Something's going. There's action. Okay, so there's certainly, the, yeah, there's a, there's a military component here. Uh, they're, they're actually both Navy. Um, but uh, but there, is, there is that military component. Um, also looking at the, presumably, the Asian people, presumably the Vietnamese people, maybe in this image, um, the way that the gentleman in the left is dressed um, looks like he could serve some kind of religious purpose or ceremonial purpose. Um, and this woman on the right side of Okay, so certainly we can observe there is, there is a religious component attached to the image. I see uh, confusion. Uh, almost like there's a linguistic barrier in there somewhere uh, and a clashing of cultures. Okay, so there you can observe a clash of cultures. I guess maybe you would infer a clash of cultures. Would you infer it? You could probably do both, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but absolutely, but there's, there's, there is the, the appearance of uh, language difficulty, and certainly there is a, a difference of culture. Yeah. Um, the woman seems to be carrying a lot of things. Is that what you're talking about? As no. if she's maybe like getting tipped off the boat. I'm not sure. Okay, but she's in, in, within that action, there's carrying. There there's, seems to be possessions involved. Uh, the woman was the migrant woman in that famous depression photo, and she's going somewhere and she doesn't know where she's going, but she's got to get her kids somewhere. Okay, yeah. Any other descriptions? Yeah. Anything else that you see? It's hard, to, you're right, but it's, it's hard. We, 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 right. we do, everyone skips that first step. And I did too when I first looked at the, the image, so. Notice the expressions on people's faces. Um, some are less serious than others. Okay, but certainly yeah, the facial expressions, I think, tell potentially a story here as well. Yes, sir. I think the woman is like the center of the stage. Absolutely. So she's she is stage center. She's the, the, the focus of the image. Yeah. Well, the gesture and a lot of where people are looking sort of draws you towards the <clears throat> the arm, you know, towards this space in the photograph, which is sort of undefined, and, and then you've just got this arm that's sort of cut off on the far left of the photograph. And so you're wondering, you know, who else is sort of in this scene that we're not seeing. So mm, it raises okay. the possibility of cropping. Or, yeah. It also looks like there's more somebody else that has gone by with more carrying on them too, because it looks similar to what she's carrying. But, you know, yeah, within that one. sort of the Are action you? or the motion is is moving in this direction. She's looking at that person, whoever it is, that's at the side. Well, we observe. Yeah, again, we go in terms of the observables. I mean, she's she's. I think the the expression is. Well, that's what drew me to the the picture I mean, when I first looked at it. So, and then uh, in terms of inference, what would we, we I've already begun to sort of infer what the, the picture means. Yes, sir. Well, um, there look, the guy in the middle um, with the glasses seems to, be, seems to be a little annoyed maybe. Like he's trying to give instructions, but I don't know exactly. He's being followed and he's kind of using body all right, let's focus on him for a second then. We have the, the, uh, the lieutenant in the, uh, in the sort of center left of the image. When we, we could infer that he's perhaps annoyed 
What else could we infer from that, from looking at that? So I think you can make many different inferences. Yes, Stephanie. Anybody ever served in the Navy here? They would never say they're well fed in the Navy, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. but you're right. I mean that in that sense. So we can we can infer that that perhaps she's a refugee, um, and you know in this observation here we have a, a difference in uh, in how we observe it. Um, he doesn't appear annoyed in your sense. Uh, he appears to be helping, trying to guide this individual, this refugee along. More sense of urgency, then, I guess. Okay, so urgency, uh, but it could be annoyance. I mean we we don't know. Um, but it could be annoyance, it could be urgency, it could be, it could be, what else could it be? Translator. A translator, perhaps. Um, so he's doing his duty, his sense of uh, his job. Doctor. He could be a doctor. Um, absolutely. There's a man in the second quadrant who seems to be aware of the photograph being taken. This gentleman here? Yeah. Okay. And I'm not sure what that means, but I'm not sure he's pleased with it being taken, it's a bit ambiguous, but. That's the beauty of the image. You know, a picture is worth a thousand words, I tell my students, and then I tell them not to give me five pictures because they'll fail uh, for <laughs> their, their essay. Um, but in this case, this picture was actually worth a book um, um, when I first looked at it. But yeah, you, you have the, the image, uh, the, the Vietnamese gentleman in the background. Um, he could be upset, he could be smiling, uh, he could be trying to, to do the job of the people up front. You know, we don't really know exactly what it is. Well, in the context of, I guess, the photographer taking the picture, it doesn't seem like he thought it was worth it. Mm -hmm. What do you think he was hoping to capture? What would you infer from that, that the individual is taking the picture? I can tell you it was a, a PO, PAO officer, so Navy uh, Public Affairs officer was taking the picture. I'll start to get some hints. Yeah. So we can infer this is an important event that's occurring, perhaps. It's worthy of being documented? Yeah, yeah. worthy of being documented. OK. I can infer that's important, but that's just me, my own personal bias. So do you think that maybe it's an important event because of the religious um, aspect? Maybe a certain organization um, helped bring some refugees or saved them? OK. So it, it could, that the religion, then we can infer the importance of, uh, of the event via religion? I think we over here then. Um, it might be for uh, American consumption to show look, the, um, the military's trying to help people, you know, um, get to where they're supposed to be going. I'm assuming these, um, these people look to be Catholics and they might be evacuated. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to say the exact same thing. I, I, I thought it was a public relations image, and I know that there were a lot of images at the time portraying sort of benevolent American paternalism, and this seems to feed into that that America is the, uh, the generous giant that will come in and, and serve people who are in need. OK. When do you think the image was taken? Can you get any, any sense of that? Any inferences from the, the actual image? OK, so we have a, a 54. Black and white, so you think it's, it's got to be a little bit older. So certainly the question, you know, when was it taken is for historians is a crucial question. What are some other questions that this image raises mm -hmm. for you? Other things you'd need to understand before you could be more um, determined or decisive in your interpretation? Yeah. Where exactly? Okay. Okay, when and where? Just because we're seeing it in black and white doesn't mean it is black and white. You got yeah, so you got to jump in. That's right. You mean black and white cameras are... Were I mean, around for, they're still around, although no one uses them. I mean, yeah. What's being said? Okay. So what, what, the, what, what is the, the source of uh, the interaction? Is, is there a, a verbal interaction? Is it simply a motion interaction? Perhaps even the language of the interaction, potentially be questions to be asked. And then the significance of, of that. Uh, we had the, the, um, 
the who and the where as well. What else? Because if we think about the what of the picture, what, what's the action, there could be other evidence that would provide answers to that. And I go back again, because I teach African American history, the example of lynching, having students read a transcript in which a man re who's being interviewed recalls a lynching that had taken place in his childhood. And then I have them listen to the audio clip. And we talk about the differences that what you hear in the audio clip is the man banging his hand on the table. You hear the man's um, kind of stuttering in his speech. You hear the pause. You hear a whole set of feelings that you wouldn't necessarily get reading the transcript. You could imagine those. You could infer some of those. So that there could be some other evidence that would answer some of these questions. How would you go about trying to find answers to some of the questions that we've raised? You know, here comes Ron. He throws this photograph in your face and says, OK, you know, tell me about this. What does this mean? The thesis word that we use sometimes with our students. What's the thesis of your essay? What's the thesis of this photograph? What's the interpretation? Where would we go to find more answers to some of the questions that we've raised? And the beauty of the thesis is Vietnam is a very visual war, is that there are no wrong answers, as we tell our students. You know, it's very subjective in this process. And you could, as you had in terms of your, your observations and your inferences, you have come up with some very different stories of, of, as to what this picture might mean. So what would be, what would be the thesis for some of you, um, knowing that you cannot add, give no wrong answer? Um, yeah? When we, if, if we assumed it was some sort of evacuation, could we look, try to find out what evacuations occurred, see if we could fit that into the story? Okay. So this, uh, yeah, the, it, the picture revolves around a, an evacuation, perhaps. Okay, okay, so if, yeah, if religion has a role, then what is that role of religion? And we could look at, um, at the, the Vietnamese, the Roman Catholic Church in Vietnam while it existed, and uh, perhaps what role it played in a potential evacuation. You think too about where did this uh, photograph come from? We know that it's part of the presentation today. We've talked a little bit about the National Archive a protocol for analyzing photographs. Did this photograph come from a public repository? Could we go and actually ourselves look at this photograph? Are there a series of photographs that we could look at that were taken at that same time? Um, who was the photographer? Or is this a photograph that Ron has in his file in his office at Millersville? Which I do. <laughs> but that's not where it is uh, originally. <laughs> Well, one of the things that, as we look at this image, and I, again, I, this image was the, the catalyst for a book that I wrote uh, called Operation Passage of Freedom, which was in 1954, uh, 54 to 55. And when I looked at the image, knowing absolutely nothing about this, what struck me was the, just the face. That's all. And this face, I was going through, I was working down at Texas Tech at the Vietnam Archive down there, and we had all these collections that had never been looked at. Um, and this was one from a, a gentleman by the name of Douglas Pike. And he had all, just stacks and boxes and boxes of stuff. And so every Friday, I would go up to the, to the storage area, pull a couple boxes down, look at the stuff, and, and then figure out if I was going to deal with it that day, that week, that month, or that year. Um, and at one Friday in 1999, I came across this photograph. And I looked at it, and I looked at the image of just the woman's face. And I went, well, this is interesting. And you know, going very quickly through these things, I looked at the back of the photograph, and it said Operation Passage of Freedom, and refugees being boarded a, sh a ship, 1954. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. You know, I'd like to look at it, but I've got two more boxes to look at, and I want to go home at five. So I, I put it away, but I, the image of the, the woman's face stuck with me. And I, I, some of you mentioned uh, sort of the anguish or the, uh, the hopelessness, and that's really what, as I looked at it, I looked at, in, in the sense, the face had all the emotions of the Vietnam War. It has um, a sense of despair, but it also has a sense of, of hope. Uh, there's frustration there, but there's also, um, I think, a, as I interpret it, someone who's finally arrived or someone who's finally escaped, someone who finally has an opportunity. Um, you know, just, it just had everything uh, within it. And that image sort of haunted me for about two years. Um, and I finally came back to it and, uh, and decided to learn something about this operation 
and I discovered nobody had ever written anything on, on Operation Passage of Freedom. It was passing in books, and I think probably if you guys got some books today, you could look at the index and see if Passage of Freedom is there, and there'll be a paragraph or a sentence or a footnote, and it'll be wrong. Um, it was an incredible operation. And you know, I, after I went and got the picture again, then I looked at the little boy, and I kind of asked myself the question, well, why is there a little boy and clearly an older woman, perhaps a grandmother, uh, where is everybody else? Where are the men of, of fighting age? Where are the women of fighting age? Um, why is there a priest over there in the corner? And some of you already, you know, the idea is an interpretation, uh, or, or sorry, be, be an interpreter. The American guy, he speaks English, and he speaks high school French. The, uh, the Vietnamese people, they speak Vietnamese, they speak no French, no English. The priest speaks Vietnamese and Latin. What just so happens, this guy is a chaplain, and he speaks Latin too. So they communicated through Latin. And all these little stories have emerged well out of this, uh, this image. Um, and as I learned more about the story through this one image, I realized this was an incredible uh, story of the Vietnam War that had been bypassed by our, our looking at the war in the 1960s. Um, should we move to the next, yeah. the next image? So again, as we go through this process, you, you asked a lot of these questions, made a lot of these observations um, that uh, I think show that the Vietnam War, again, is a very complex and multidimensional uh, um, event in our history and also in the history of the Vietnamese. So, where, where was the oh, it began in, um, in uh, Hanoi and Haiphong. That is in the north. Uh, in Haiphong, there's a, a, a sort of a natural harbor called uh, uh, Dak Son. And then they came down to uh, Saigon and uh, uh, Capsaic Shock or Vung Tau, which is known today. And some to Da Nang or, or Turan. Um, Navy moved about 310,000 Vietnamese in 1954 to 55. And yet we don't know anything about it. And, and they did it uh, via vessel, I would assume, because the overland passage was impossible in the North Vietnamese control of the um, Actually, it was the most efficient way to move the, uh, the refugees. So 310,000 were moved by Navy ship of the 810,000 who, who left. And they went by, by Navy ship, by uh, aircraft, and by on foot, just depending on where you lived in the country. So if you lived just north of the DMZ, you would simply walk through if you could get through, if they would allow you. From north to south? From north, north to south, yeah. So, but that was before the so-called American official involvement. Well, it's under the French, French uh, war. Actually, well, it depends right. on where you start. It, it depends on where, where you, you start it. And I would, I would make the argument this is the first major American right. operation. Right. And it's an operation that relates, in, it's a humanitarian operation. It's actually the largest humanitarian sea lift in history, in our world's history. Um, but it's overshadowed by, by events that occur beginning with the you know, combat troops in 65 or the advisors that, that get in there, it, were active under Kennedy in 61. Was it a consequence of the division of the country? Yes, it was. It, yeah, yeah, as a result of the 54 Geneva Agreement. So the three of the articles under the agreements covered the movement of troops north to south, south to north. About 80,000 went to the north and 810,000 went uh, from north to south. And actually some of those 80,000 were rotated through American ships and brought down intelligence to the, the, uh, the former Viet Minh or the, you know, the pre Viet Cong people. So, yeah? Where were the refugees taken to? Um, mostly to Saigon and then uh, uh, Vung Tau or Cap Saint Jacques was, was the overflow spot. And then they were resettled. They had a rehabilitation resettlement, um, which really covered most of, uh, of um, Saigon northward up into the, the plains, up into the, the highland area. And they were settled in, in villages. Uh, incredibly complex operation for a country that had no infrastructure at all because the French left them nothing. Um, so it was, that's really where the Americans became involved in the process. Is this a conscious decision of the people or were they forced out? Um, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> um, but most of, you know, there's the combination of three different motives for movement. One was they worked with the French and they were going to be killed or certainly all their possessions taken away. And that probably moved about a third of the population. Uh, about a third of the population was uh, Catholic and they were either moved because they needed to, to flee what they feared to be communist retribution or they were told to, to leave by their, their local priest uh, or they were encouraged to leave by uh, propaganda and it really varies in that. And then the other third are individuals who moved because someone else moved, 
Uh, they were part of one of the, the ethnic minorities. The woman actually was uh, part of one of the uh, ethnic minorities of the North that uh, she knew she was going to be um, persecuted if she stayed in the North. Um, so yeah, that's about the other third of the group. But that's, those aren't accurate numbers, but they're pretty close. Um, so there's a lot of powerful motivations to move. Uh, so you can see a lot from the image. So this is actually uh, a, uh, the Chinese Nung, one of their traditional headdresses. Um, so she knew she was going to be in trouble. But again, if you look at there's there's so much to the image. You have the again the navy officer in the back, um, who's purportedly overseeing the the embarkation of the, the refugees. But in fact, if he's a good officer, he's probably doing nothing but just watching and allowing his junior officers to do what they're supposed to do. Uh, the image there's a number of these images at the website we're going to be looking at later on, um, uh, the, the Vietnam Archive website. So you can see a number of these pictures, and I actually included a number from after I finished my research. But you can see that the sort of the chaos that's involved in the operation. Um, let's let's go to the next one. I think, in terms of just our, our time, um, we want to do something similar to what we did to the first. But I think, if I'm correct, what we're going to do is divide the class sort of in. Everyone have, have, have a partner. In ha oh yeah, that's right. So we can partner up. So if you could just move. So move to the Some nearest person need next to you. Need to get a partner. <laughs> And hopefully we're somewhat even. If we can have. <laughs> and that way, if you don't know your neighbor, you, you can meet your neighbor. So we have one extra here. One here, one extra here. Mm. Yeah. We have three up here, so if you're yeah, looking we got, for a partner. We got two groups of three, so it's better if we have two uh, groups of two. Don't be shy. Should we put both up at yeah. once? Okay. So what, what, a little logistic direction here. The person on the left, person on the left, raise your hand of your partner. You're going to be uh, evaluating using the questions and the sheet you have in front of you, the image. Okay, the person on the right, raise your hands, people on the right. You're going to be evaluating the oral interview excerpt. Now, you can't cheat. So if you're looking at the oral history, you have to ignore the picture completely and vice versa. And we'll know. <laughs> so let me there, give you uh, five short questions for the interview. Number one, who is talking? And again, like the photograph we did before, you're just going to have to do your best. Again, these are for folks on the right. Number two, who is doing the interviewing? Number one, who is talking? Number two, who is interviewing? Number three, what is the subject of the interview? Number four, why is the interview being conducted? So one, who is talking? Two, who is interviewing? Three, what is the subject? Four, why is the interview being conducted? And number five, and the last one, is what are the circumstances of the interview? So we're going to ask you to do the same thing we did with the photograph, which is before you leap to inference, <laughs> read, study, describe the interview. And then you can start to address some of the more interpretive questions. Yeah. List. Okay? Yeah. So list some of the, the items, the topics, the phrases that come up. So we'll give you about 10 minutes. Starting now. Starting now. <laughs> I'll put my timer on. Did you need, we go through the questions again? You need the questions again? OK. And you're not allowed to share. So right now, you should be working on your own individual analysis, and then you'll have some time to put the two pieces together.
pieces of evidence on the slide, 1 plus 1 equals what? So when you add the photograph and the excerpt from the oral interview together, what do you get? That's number one. So one conclusion, one sentence, one interpretive statement. And the second thing is one question. So one conclusion and one question from each pair. So we'll give you some more time to talk with your partner and come up with that. Who wants to offer a conclusion, however tentative? Let me ask this first. In terms of all the pairs, how many of you could agree to a common conclusion? And how many, so raise your hands if you could agree to a common conclusion, if you're really comfortable with it. So the rest of you then, you couldn't agree. It's okay not to agree um, in most classes. Uh, you know, but in this sense, it's okay, because again, it's very subjective in terms of how we interpret and how we infer. Um, but if you could, that'd be great. So, Who wants are, to get it started? Yeah. Anyone? Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Well, we concluded that there were serious cultural barriers between the people carrying out this evacuation and the people who were the beneficiaries of the evacuation. Um, in the passage, there's a discussion about uh, how the food that the Americans tried to give to the Vietnamese uh, really uh, was, was not suitable, they didn't like it. Uh, I think in the photograph we see that uh, this, uh, this naval officer is trying to, to assist this boy, and the boy doesn't quite seem to understand what the officer is talking about. So even, even in this humanitarian action, there was this major barrier in place. And you see evidence for your conclusion both in the photograph and the oral history yes. excerpt, okay. So a clash of cultures, that's, that's good. Um, we concluded that it was a goodwill operation, that the Vietnamese response didn't necessarily match the idea conveyed in the photograph, which appears to be a PR shot. So are you suggesting that there's some tension between the photograph and the, I, yeah. can you say more about that? Even before I knew about the interview, it seemed like a stage shot because it didn't seem like two adults have to tell a boy how to get food, it's right in front of him. Um, so it just seemed like they set that up to, for some purpose. trying to feed the people, um, and I think they wanted, maybe the government was showing that piece of it, that look, we're trying, to, we're feeding these people. And in, in some sense, it almost seems like the, the question is asked in response to the photograph, like, what's happening here, right? Oh, we, you know, we tried to feed them, we cooked all this fish, and you know, it turns out that they weren't interested, they weren't happy to eat. Now, a guy from the Army would say, well, it takes a two, at least two Navy guys to, to you know, teach someone how to eat. So, whereas the army, they could do it in one. But yeah, so it certainly there's a there's that that conflict or that tension between the two. Yeah. Just in the, in the quote, now that I've actually read it since uh, I had the image, they say they're in rebellion. They're standing in line getting food. Doesn't really, at least from when I first look at the picture, doesn't look like rebellion in the least bit. So it seems like just from the image, oh, they're getting food. The soldiers are helping them. Humanitarian mission, but when you read the quote, then that really, I think, reveals the cultural barriers. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Or you, do you have your hand up? Would you say? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, So the sequence matters and dates matter. And if you think about in a history classroom, um, I know I am careful to insist not necessarily on the exact day, but I'm trying to make the point with students that it's not that historians are pinheaded people who are obsessed with you know, details, but it's important to know whether something happened in 1852 or 1855. And since I teach 19th century history, if something happened in 1875, it probably did not cause the American Civil War. So that if you want to be straight with causes and consequences, which are really what historians are most interested in, that's why sequence matters. So that if we think about this as a great question, 
you know, was the photograph a response, a PR effort to a address a problem that had come up, a kind of cultural conflict. Great goals, execution runs into a ground a bit. You know, was this to kind of persuade everybody that things were really smoother than they actually were? Other conclusions? I just out of curiosity, in terms of sequencing, how many think the, the photograph came first? So the rest of you then would have the, the image come first? Okay. I'm not going to tell you. No. <laughs> the actually the photograph came second. Um, as the, the premise is you put them together, right? They, they don't go together. Oh, no, they don't go together. No, right. but in terms of the chronology. You didn't, you didn't say that to begin with. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. well, of course not. I wouldn't, I wouldn't give it away. But uh, yeah, no, it, it's a, uh, this is actually an oral history that's done. Um, almost uh, 45, 46 years after the, the event itself. But it's the, the, um, the ship that, uh, that Leo was on, um, this particular one occurred after the, uh, the photograph, after the actual image was taken. Oh, excuse me, before the image was taken. Um, it was on his, this is on the Montrose. He was on the, the very first ship to, uh, to take refugees to Menard. So they learned from this process, and then they had this, the image of showing the, the kindly Americans, showing them how to, how to feed, or how to, how to go through and what to do in terms of eating. So, yeah? The question, and I guess it's, the people in the back room aren't eating, and they're not, you don't really look interested in eating. So is a rebellion happening? Well, it's not really a rebellion. I think a rebellion is a, a strong word. It's a word that actually came to his mind when he was thinking about this. But it's, it's more of a... Um, it's the kindly reluctance, I would call it. Because this occurs on almost every ship. And really, going that, that first thing, it's a clash of culture. Uh, not understanding that he says fish, they're sardines. Well, who likes sardines? They're very salty. I mean, the Vietnamese, well, I, I do too, actually, but that's beside the point. But for the Vietnamese, sardines isn't part of the staple diet. And the cooking of the rice, um, the Vietnamese have a very unique way of cooking rice that's, that's different than certainly the, uh, the Navy. Um, so I mean that's so it is that it's that learning process. So yeah, rebellion, I think is probably too strong of a word. But that's the word he thought of, you know, in in, in terms of his memory. Yeah, but he's saying those words because they're very derogatory. But he's not saying them at the time. He's saying them forty years after. Oh yeah, yeah. So what does yeah. that mean that's then? Another one, that's another oh, it's aspect. it's another whole layer, that's absolutely. Aspect yeah. Because is that does does this language, which is extremely harsh, represent the language? You know, maybe he's an old guy now, and he says, oh, those stupid people, they didn't like our cooking. But is that how soldiers reacted at the time, or is that just filtered through his memory? Yeah. Well, I, it's an interesting point, because that goes into interpretation and perspective. I didn't really, I didn't t see it as a, a very derogatory yeah. statement. My kids rebel every other night. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, cut out the sardines and you'll be okay. But, 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 it, but that's the beauty of, of how we, we interpret documents, oral histories in this case, and, and images, because we, you're right, we, we can bring a lot into this. And it's because we are both of an age where we cook for our children. And when we say they wouldn't eat this, <laughs> it, it is derogatory. <laughs> that's what the connotation was. <laughs> yeah. So they Barbara? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. This is not, this is a different kind of juxtaposition. Right. It's not only a juxtaposition of media, but it's a juxtaposition of time. Of time. And if you don't know that, if you didn't have the, the indication on, on the bottom of when these photos were taken, or the photo was taken, and the oral history was taken, you're missing an important element. Absolutely. And one of the reasons why we didn't put that um, identification on was we wanted people to ask themselves, as a matter of protocol, well, when? That was the question that you didn't know. And then we could ask ourselves, once we do know, it's 2001, you know, if it was 1954, how would that be different? Yeah. Well, because the issue yeah. of history and memory, exactly. Well, right. Yesterday we were talking about remembrance, mm -hmm. about the, you know, the war and the issue about the wall and everything about how it's going to be remembered. So to me, this makes a huge difference that is filtered through this person's memory. Yeah. And there's no uh, way to And it's a big chunk of years. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there's no way to do what, Barbara? There's no way to ascertain from the text of 
themselves, right, when they were created. So you need that information in order to make that next level of inference. Otherwise, you're, you're flying a little bit blind. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, we wanted you to fly a little bit blind. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. And I think uh, just to maybe explain the language a bit, uh, it's not just a clash of Vietnamese culture and American culture. It's a clash of Vietnamese culture and American military culture, which is much different than civilian uh, culture. And so um, this, in my opinion, would be like a naval officer or a chief petty officer who is explaining what happened. He obviously wasn't one of the cooks. Yeah, he's a JG. Who's the we here, right? Yeah. Uh, Lieutenant JG was what he was. They, so. And so they, they, they might interpret this as a rebellion because they're used to their troops, you know, following orders, you know, somewhat religiously. Yeah. Yeah. Also, right. we don't know his tone as he's saying it. He could be laughing at some point. Yeah, That's absolutely. True. That's right. It's kind of like the joke was on us that we didn't yeah. get that yeah. Yeah. from the get-go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was a really good point. Like, what's in that? Yeah. Right? Yeah. It was a couple of hums and haws. There was there were no no actual words. I mean, no actual no no words that conveyed meaning. But yeah. Did you show the soldiers you interviewed any of the photographs that you had found? They had their own. They had their own. Yeah. And when it, when you go well, oral histories are. I don't know if you guys have a lesson on oral history. That's another whole day, or if you've already had it. Uh, not not oh. necessarily this group. But okay. We offer, yeah. Of course, in terms of, of, of how one approaches oral histories, and certainly with memory, because this is, again, 45 years after they... So I, I went through a longer process of um, usually some, some pre-interview questions, and uh, most of them offered photographs, and we would work through those photographs, or I would, I would offer them some, uh, some images. But I, you don't want to taint the oral history by providing a, a spin on how you want it to be, um, how you want it to happen, because my purpose was just to get their, their, their emotions. Um, I had the history, and actually a lot of them forgot the history because, again, this was, for them, a three to six, 12-day period. But what struck me as amazing when I talked to these guys is they remembered detailed events of the three days they spent with the Vietnamese, 46 years after. Now, they couldn't remember, you know, anything else about their military experience, but they remembered Operation Passage of Freedom and, and the impact it had on them, uh, their, their emotional impact or the, uh, the sense of moral purpose that they... they uh, they derived from the, the experience they had with the Vietnamese. And especially, I mean, maybe we'll get, I don't want to give this away, but there's, within the, the image itself, there's a, an important part that maybe someone will come up in, the, in terms of the conclusions. Whether, you know, there was just a thought that came to mind. Uh, there was a piece in Science uh, Times last week in the uh, US Times that was about um, research related to not visual culture, but uh, auditory culture, and how um, a lot of what we sense and feel from the environment is actually auditory rather than visual. And I think that it raises, when you talked about the transcription, um, that that meaning is, is necessarily lost with transcription. Right. That there's a lot that gets communicated just in the way that we speak and what we hear in the background sound and all of that, that simply can't be captured, but adds a lot of layers of meaning that you know are not retrievable. So I think that that's, um, it's sort of a, a problem with any sort of historical inquiry aim for, for similitude or getting closer, but we are bound by the limits of the tools that we use in the media that, that construes those. Absolutely. And then you take it a step further in terms of the, uh, the oral presentation. If you videotape these, then you can get the hand gestures and, right. um, or the, you know, the, the relaxation or the, uh, the tension that's involved in conversations. Absolutely. So let's go back to, um, to conclusions or questions. We have any, yeah. So my question, I guess, before was that um, why the people in the back aren't eating, and uh, you know, so if if at this time they were accepting the food or not, and maybe they weren't, but they just asked for, for the potatoes. 
Yeah, it's actually not a posed photograph from my understanding of it. Um, so what, do you want to try to answer that question? Or should we go on with more questions? I don't know how we're doing with time. Uh, well, I think we have a few more minutes yeah. or two. Anybody else want to add on to that, and respond yeah. to that, or add additional comments or questions? Yeah, Barbara? We wondered if this cultural misunderstanding was indicative of, or representative of cultural misunderstandings throughout the war, and uh, if you think it was, but also, was there not also some cultural misunderstanding on the other side, that the Vietnamese perhaps didn't fully understand this American, American but they made gestures to try to keep them and help them? Absolutely. And I think that's, I mean, that's a very good observation. Uh, for the Vietnamese, as they come aboard these ships, a lot of the stories that come out of their experiences relate to the sense of terror, anxiety and terror. Uh, and it's terror based upon propaganda that they've been fed, that the Americans are going to take them out to sea, they're going to beat them up, they're going to throw them overboard. They're going to take them in these big LSTs, those doors will open up like a huge dragon, and they're going to be asked to walk through the mouth of the dragon, and there's a lot of superstition built into that. Um, one of, I, there's a longer story, which I can't really share, um, but the, the gist of it is, as the Vietnamese come aboard, they go through this process of, of being cleaned and fed and uh, talking to the sailors, and there's a misunderstanding in the process as the little girl comes aboard the ship. The biggest American sailor on the ship is, is head of the welcoming committee. He asks a question in English to the Vietnamese priest, who understands a little bit of English and misinterprets the question. And uh, she thinks that the, the sailor is, is being angry at him, but the translation is, no, he's blessing you. Um, and then we go through this process, and she's dirty. Uh, so he goes and takes and, and uh, helps to clean her with soap. She's never seen soap before in this process. She goes back to her mother, and the mother says, what happened? You know, I was very worried about you. And the little girl says, mommy, don't worry. The American priest was baptizing me. And they thought they, so they thought all the sailors were priests because they were all acting very kindly in that association with the one priest and that they were going through this process of you know, American baptism and, and then you know, feeding and, and all that, that process. And the end story, the, the old lady, she goes up to the, one of the sailors and she says, you know, we were told lies. We thought we were going to be beaten. We thought we were going to be over, over, uh, overthrown overboard. You know, all the possessions taken away. Uh, killed, and instead what happened is we, we come aboard, you shared your food, you shared your, your, um, you know, your kindness with us, you baptized us in the American way, and uh, you were all very kind, you know, gently priests. And so they ended up calling everyone on the ship uh, Padre, except for the one man, David Bullingham, they called him the bishop, because he was the one, the biggest guy there. But I mean that, but so we have that misunderstanding, and this is a clash of culture. Uh, this is, a, you know, it's language, it's food, it's, it's hygiene, it's everything. But it's not a, a, a clash of culture that is, is necessarily a negative clash of culture. It's a very positive clash of culture in many respects. And, and both sides are trying to work out some common understanding of what's going on through language barriers and through culture barriers and, and things of that nature. But that's something we don't learn about the Vietnam War. Um, now, the, question, the longer question, does this clash of culture exist throughout the war? Absolutely. Is it negative in many places? Absolutely. But it's also positive. Um, and I think we need to understand that as, as you teach the war, that it's not negative image after negative image after negative image. There are some stories and there's some very powerful stories of individuals who, as you know, the, one of the talks I give is called a heart of gold. Um, and since there are a lot of Americans who go to Vietnam because they have a heart of gold and they do things, they see problems and they try to fix them. And this, that story occurs again and again on this ship, or on all the ships that were involved. So that's a tangent, sorry. What about questions? We've kind of touched on some of those, but do folks have other questions that these two pieces of evidence raise on their own or taken side by side? Yeah. So what's kind of the short term, and we can imagine also the long term process of evacuation and resettlement? Would it be very different? We had a trip tech, again, to use an art history expression. On the, on the other side of the photograph was an excerpt from an oral interview with one of the people who was on the boat. Again, the diff they're both there, different experiences, different assumptions, different ideas, different concerns. Uh, just out of curiosity, when, when they would drop the refugees off uh, on land, uh, were there other military units that escorted them into the country uh, to aid in resettlement, or were they just left there on land? Oh no, they had uh, they had civilian and military 
um, civic affairs, essentially, so the United States Overseas Mission and all the components of that under the Foreign uh, Affairs Office, or Foreign Office, Foreign Affairs Office. Um, they, they went through refugee camps and then from there went to uh, resettlement camps, rehabilitation resettlement. It's a huge enterprise um, through the whole process, yeah. And then eventually they were left in a village with supplies and they had to make do. And there was a lot of problems with that, but that, again, that's a much longer story in this process. So look, um, we've already done all this. How about that? Um, Restocking? Yeah, well, just well, on that, the picture, um, why feed the kid first? I think that was a, the question here. So, and the answer is actually, I think, how American sailors are very smart. It's if you can capture the kids, if you can get the kids to do something, then the parents are going to follow. Um, and that occurs again and again on whatever thing the Americans needed to do, um, which I think in, in part is, again, one of those messages of the image that uh, I found striking. Such as that. I think there's that, the, the sense of building the trust becomes, the, the, the process is quickened when the Vietnamese, elder Vietnamese, and these are grandparent age Vietnamese, see that the, the children are being cared for. They're being fed, they're being bathed, that the children are coming back and they're telling these stories that, hey, this is, you know, they, they don't understand the politics of everything or even the clash of cultures, but the sailors are buying them everything out of the, the, uh, the ship stores that they can get. So ice cream, candy, fruits, vegetables, everything they have, and they're giving them to the kids because that's what sailors do when they see people in need, at least these sailors. And so the kids are, are reaping the benefits, and the older folks are seeing this. And so that, in terms of Vietnamese culture, uh, it's not really an issue. It actually quickens the process of, of trust. Um, you know, you know, in the three-day journey that they have. I forgot who asked that, how long the question was. So it's a three-day journey. Uh, so you don't have a lot of time to build the trust, but it, it occurs very quickly. Yes, Stephanie. This is kind of a, a side question, but you mentioned the, the refugee camps that they went through when they were relocated. Was there like a re-education kind of component tied into that? Because I know with Korea, if someone moves from North Korea to South Korea, there's, a, I guess, re, there's some kind of educational components in teaching the different social values and ideals. Not necessarily, no. I mean, I, I know what, you're, what you mean. Remember, this is early on in the, um, in the war. So this is at the end of the first Indochina War. Um, and I think, you know, the answer, because why there is not, is because of just the mass confusion that's created through the, the introduction of 810,000 individuals who brought with them nothing but what they could carry on their backs uh, into a country that had no infrastructure because the French colonial system provided none. And they didn't allow for the Vietnamese to... Um, to really rise up in, in terms of the civil service, uh, you know, colonial civil service, to handle the types of issues that they would have to do. So there's, it's low on the priority list. Uh, there is education opportunities, but they're not uh, in terms of re-education to acclimate into a new culture. A lot of these folks are, are settled together in villages. Um, yeah, that's a much longer story <laughs> as well. So. Just going to kind of jump in on yeah. that. That um, conversation we had about the image, I think, raises one question among many that we could continue to explore in the time that we have, which is how do we perceive the American soldier in Vietnam? I said at the beginning we were going to ask you to uh, create a mini, very, very modest visual narrative um, composed of three slides. And what we're going to ask you to do is, step with Stephanie's help, get some more computers and also um, figure out where you're going to post your PowerPoint presentations. But let's just talk a little bit about the, the process. So we think about images and how they can communicate and convey many different things. These are four images of American soldiers in Vietnam. And we could take you know, half a day on each of these images and try to pull them apart. Um, but what we wanted to do here is to present a diverse set of images as an introduction for your hands-on activity, which is to go to the Vietnam Center and Archive website. And I'm just going to go through the directions, and Stephanie will get the computers out. So we'll go, and we're going to be searching the archive. 
we're going to be looking um, using the advanced search feature because what we're interested in for our purposes today are the images. And Ron has selected some keywords. And so what we're going to do is divide folks into groups, but you'll use this keyword menu. So I think probably, let's see how many groups we have. We have one. Do you want to count on? There's 24 one? people, right? I think I counted. So we do groups of three? Yeah. Okay. And we have, well, we have five groups. Well, at least for the, the students, let's put them in groups of three. There's 15 of them, right? Okay, so 15 groups of, or th five groups of three. And for the observers, you can join any group you want to. How about that? Um, so who are our students in the group? Let's, maybe we can start here. Yeah. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, three. so you guys okay. are, are group, group one. Group one, maybe you can go with two people in the, right behind you. Okay. Okay, that's the second group. One, two, three. One, two, three. And then you folks can be a pair, I guess. Okay. That's, that's not really 15. That'll work. That'll work. Okay, group one. Your keywords, you might want to write these down, are combat and soldier. Group one. Group two, combat and troops. Group three, aid and soldier, group four, assistance, and US, and then group five, damage, and US. I think you're one. I'm sorry. You folks are one. Well, yeah, the, going. yeah, this group is one. You guys are group two. Group I'm three. sorry, yeah. Group three. So we're going in a zigzag, I guess. Group four. One, two. And group five. Three, four, five. Yeah. And basically what we do is take a look at the archive. This is a, um, the virtual Vietnam archive is, it's a massive archive collection of, of documents, oral histories, uh, moving images, still images, uh, artifact images, um, which you'll be able to go through and uh, you can select your own image and go through the, the questions that we ask based on the, uh, the handout we gave you for the observables, the inference, and the... Uh... Just kind of a note on format. Uh, one possible way of approaching this in the classroom, I'm sure we've had our students do uh, PowerPoints quite often. Um, what I encourage my students to do is to, again, as I said earlier, put the evidence on the slide and put their interpretation in the notes section so that they don't give away their interpretation by putting it on the slide. People read the slide and then don't listen to what people have to say. So that the notes section can serve both as a place for a script, and that also makes the PowerPoint presentation portable because you have the narration if it wasn't done um, using the audio feature. And it's also a good place for students to get into the habit of keeping track of where they find things. So I always encourage my students to put their references in the way that they would footnote a paper, for example, in the notes section. So that we could, if we go to the notes section, we should be able to get back to the image rather than students handing something in saying, I got this at www.google.com. <laughs> well, no, that's really not going to work for me to get back to your image. So we'll give you about um, 15 minutes. Three slides might be ambitious in that amount of time, but so you try one or two. What you want to do is, Think about a question, do what an historian does, you have some questions already, go to the archive, you have some topics, and then you want to pick some evidence that addresses in some fashion your keywords. And then you want to figure out what, what are you going to say about that evidence? What conclusions can you offer? What kind of questions do you want to raise for us to consider? Okay. And Stephanie, you have something about the wiki you're going to? Yes, um, the menu bar in the wiki, you can find the list of links to the websites that you guys recommended. And also, when you get ready to post your PowerPoint slides that you have made, if you log into ClassWeb, we've made a folder that says folder with projects for PowerPoint. And you can just upload them to that file. Just be sure to name anything that you upload with your name in the title so that we know. We don't have all presentation it. ones. Right. So hopefully, if you have any questions, just let me know. I can't find them. Just to clarify, for the purposes of this activity, we're going to ask you to use this particular archive, which is on that list of resources. And then you can go use some of those other resources later on. Because the keywords that Ron selected relate particularly to this archive.
And I assume that most people are probably pretty familiar with being able to take an image that you find on the web and put it in your PowerPoint presentation. But if you have any trouble with that, just holler and we'll come. Someone will help you out with that. 